So uh, when, uh, when Chad wrote me and said, hey, do you mind speaking at VBS? I said, sure, you know. He was like, we're doing a theme on courageous kids. And I was thinking, all right, I'm going to get, you know, get something good going here. And uh, I, I always preface everything I say with I'm, I'm not a preacher. I never went to preaching school. Uh, my, my preaching background is basically being raised in the church and, and speaking where I needed to speak. And uh, so when he said, uh, hey, you got Josiah, I was like, awesome. Who's Josiah? And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I remember who Josiah is. It's one of those stories that maybe, you know, we've heard quite a bit about or throughout the years, but it's not something that we've ever really took and, and dug deep down into in, in, in my upbringing, kind of like in how the kids today are, are learning about Josiah. The sad thing is they may not hear about him again for a while, but I think there's a lot of really good information that we can, we can glean from his life and kind of his background and, and everything. Well, I also got a little bit more information last night that uh, this is supposed to be a class, not an opportunity for me to speak at you and for you to just sit there. So I'm going to request one thing this evening, that is you speak up and you help me with this class. Like I said, I never claimed to be an educated person. I never claimed to be good at anything. So you guys have got to help make this class what it is. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Oh man, we're already off to a bad start. <laughs> this is going to be a long two hours. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> there we go. All right, so Josiah. How many of y'all know the story of Josiah? Just a show of hands. Okay. All right. So those are the people that have already volunteered to do a lot of the speaking this evening. Uh, congratulations. Um, Josiah. So there's two main books that we glean information from Josiah on. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at 2 Chronicles, uh, really kind of focusing around chapter 34, and kind of that's where the meat of what happens with Josiah is about. And I like the Chronicles version of it versus the uh, Second Kings version, uh, where they do somewhat mirror each other. It's just, for me, Chronicles kind of lays it out a little bit better. Um, so we're going to be studying from that. So a couple of stats on Josiah. How old was Josiah when he came into power? Eight. Now, is that uncommon for kings at that time? Yes, for, for a lot of the, the Jewish kings, that's fairly young. Um, even when we look into Egyptian kings and, and kind of some other pharaohs of that time period, you know, we see some other really famous kings. Uh, King Tut, Tutankhamun, was about 10 years old uh, when he came into power over Egypt. And, you know, we kind of see other little sporadic uh, uh, things like that. Even in the, the Chinese dynasties, we see a couple of very young kids that, that end up taking control. You know, and a lot of it's focused on lineage, right? Kind of who's, who was your daddy and, and how did you end up coming into power? Well, they placed a lot of emphasis on, on lineage. But Joseph came into reign at eight years old. Uh, does anyone know who his father was? We'll be talking a little bit about him and a little bit about his granddad, too. Of course, his father was Amon. Okay, and he wasn't king for very long, was he? How long was Amon king for before uh, Josiah came into to reign? Two years. There you go. All right, so he was only king for two years. And then his father, uh, who was Manasseh, who we have a city that's named after that, um, his father actually reigned for quite a bit longer than, than Amon did. Um, but all of this kind of leads up to, to kind of define a little bit about the beginning of Josiah and kind of what he was brought into when he took, when he took reign of, uh, of Judea. So why did Joseph become king at so young? Succession. <laughs> succession. So in, in a succession pattern, what had to happen? His father died. His father died. That's right. Matter of fact, if you have your Bibles open, and we're at uh, 2 Chronicles, when we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 33, we get an idea of what kind of happened. If you look down there at verse 21, 
Second Chronicles 33. And it says, Amon was 22 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as Manasseh his father had done. Amon sacrificed to all the images that Manasseh his father had made and served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord, as Manasseh his father had humbled himself. But this Amon incurred guilt more and more, and his servants conspired against him and put him to death in his house. But the people of the land struck down all those who had conspired against King Amon, and the people of the land made Josiah his son, king in his place. So Amon, we get right from the, from the idea in this short little summary of who Amon was, he had, he had all of this ability to leave behind a major legacy, didn't he? And he left about a three, uh, a three, or one paragraph long statement that said he wasn't a very good person. You know, so it kind of sets Josiah up for what? for not a very good start as being a king. Uh, how many of y'all allow your eight-year-olds to uh, stay at, house, at the house by themselves? How many, uh, how many of your eight-year-olds hop in the car and drive around, kind of do what they want? Yeah, so here we have an eight-year-old that has just now taken over a kingdom whose father before him was not a very good person based on the description. You know, so in all, in all essence of the word, if we kind of looked at how kids are raised today and we looked at, let's say, that their, their household upbringing wasn't a very good one, the father wasn't a very good father, you know, what do we kind of expect out of that kid? What are some things you might expect out of a, out of a child who's raised inside of an unruly house or a house that is, is certainly not one that is, is of good? They describe Amon as doing all things evil in the sight of the Lord. So what kind of kid do you think that would, would, that would raise today? A what, what? Yeah, there's a, there's a major problem in there. But let's take a look. So if, you're, if you've got your Bibles open, just go ahead and flip over to uh, chapter 34, 2 Chronicles. And let's just kind of look at how Josiah starts his reign. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And this is a preface for leading up into verse 3. So in verse 3 it says, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David his father. So at eight years old, we have this, eight -year -old, this, this king take over. At the eighth year of his reign, that makes him how old? Sixteen years old. He starts to look or seek after the God of David. Now, if we flip back up into verse 2, we kind of look at once he starts finding the God of David, he, he does not turn to the right hand or to the left hand. Once he finds what's right, he does what? He sticks with it. You know, I think sometimes when we look at uh, uh, new converts to Christianity even. When we see people come into Christianity, what, what generally happens? They're on fire, right? They're, they're making these major changes in their lives. They're, they're giving up things that are not necessarily good that's in their lives. They're, they're making all these switches. Maybe they're changing friends, in some cases changing jobs. They're making the total switch. They want to do what's right. But what's the unfortunate thing we see with a lot of people when they begin making all those changes? It gets hard to keep up with that lifestyle. If, if you're ingrained in that worldly lifestyle and you're, you're not really wanting to let go of it, sometimes it's really hard to hold on to that, that faith that you had when you first started. But we see a 16-year-old who does not turn to the right hand and who does not turn to the left hand. Now, I don't know about y'all. I'm in... in my other line of work, I, of course, some of y'all know I own a gym, and, and we're very athletically minded. And, and for me, competition is a big part of that. And if I hear that there's a 16-year-old that is more willing and more dedicated than I am, it makes me want to step my game up. It makes me want to try a little bit harder. You know, one day I want someone to say about me, I want them to say, you know, that Aaron Stice guy, he found the truth, and he didn't turn to the right hand or to the left hand. He stuck with it. 
No one says it's going to be easy. It certainly wasn't easy being an eight-year-old eight year coming into power and having all of this stuff around him. You know, like I said, what happens if you let your eight-year-old go loose in the, in the cabinets of your house where there's cookies and all this other stuff? They won't eat an ounce of vegetables until you come back home because they're going to raid the pantry and do whatever they want. But we don't see that with Josiah. What we see with, with him is a, is a young boy who wanted to follow after the God of David, his father. So let's take a look at a couple of things. So at 16, again, he began to seek the God of, of, of David. Uh, and if we kind of look at a timeline, this is about 10 years after Manasseh had ended his reign. Uh, and, and one of the things that Manasseh had done is, is he, just like Amon, had taken and started off on the wrong path. Amon's life ended a little bit earlier. Uh, Manasseh had the opportunity to kind of change some things around and get his life back in line with God. And he even made a push similar to what Josiah does to follow back to God. Uh, but his reign ended. And uh, at the 12th year of his reign, about 20 years old, Josiah purges Judea. Now, what does the term purge mean? Clean out. Clean out. So is it sort of cleaned out? What's the, what's, the, what's the definition of even clean out mean? What's that mean? Eliminate things that are bad. Okay. Eliminate some of the things that are bad? Why? It's something in your family. You try to purge it. You try to eliminate it. Okay. So to cut it out entirely, right? Now, does that mean cut out some of the things that are bad? All the things that are bad. All of the things that are bad. You know, we talk, we talk at Tallapoosa quite a bit about the word all. Y'all know what all means, right? All means all. It means there ain't nothing else. All means all. So when you talk about purging all of the things that are bad, guess what that means? All the things have got to go. And when we look at Josiah and what he begins to do, when he purges, purges it, he goes after that, that idea of it. He wants to get rid of all of it. Uh, so, at the time before Josiah comes into the power and starts following God, or following after the God of David, and, and trying to find out who he is, there was a turn. Now, is Israel, Judea, are, are they unfamiliar with God? No. They shouldn't be? No? Are they unfamiliar with God? No. Now, forgetting doesn't mean unfamiliar. It means they just forgot. But they are not unfamiliar with God. They knew exactly who God was. You know, when we look at the time from Manasseh to the time that, that uh, Josiah begins to turn the people back or seek after God, like I said, it's only been about 10 years. So the people in that 10-year time period went from worshiping and knowing God to somehow forgetting Him. So they were very familiar with who God was. Now, what they were doing with that knowledge is something totally different. But what happened to the temple during this time? Went into disrepair. You know, kind of like with anything, if we don't take care of it, what happens? It falls apart, doesn't it? You know, if we don't take care of our cars, <laughs> uh, you'll end up blowing um, rod bearings and then eventually the uh, main shaft bearing which is uh, something Melissa and I just come to find out with. You, know, you end up messing things up if you don't take care of it. You know, so you have to take care of things. And that includes your education. You know, one of the reasons why these people may have moved away from God during the time of Manasseh and Ammon is because of what? What are some ideas? What are some reasons why they may have moved away from God? No leadership? What was that, Johnny? Okay, some other things were more appealing or alluring, right? There's maybe the grasser is greener on the other side. You know, I get to see all these pagans. You know, they're making a lot of money. You know, they get to, they get to drive the latest chariots. You know, whatever it is, right? You know, in some cases, they take and they look at, well, it seems to me that God isn't taking care of us the way that I want him to take care of us. You know, do we get stuck in that mindset sometimes? How many of y'all have looked at some of these other uh, 
other religions and how, how maybe rich some of the people are in there. You know, we have a discussion with uh, a friend of ours quite often who she tells us that all we have to do is turn our lives over to God and we're going to become wealthy, filthy rich. She's not even talking about wealthy in the spirit or in knowledge or in love or in brotherly kindness. She's talking about literal dollars and cents. Some people have got away confused, don't they? You know, so sometimes we have the lack of leadership, alluring things over to another religion. What is it? What are some other ideas? Why might they have turned from a God who led them out of Egypt, who fed them for 40 years, who took care of them, who brought them into the land, who gave them everything they had? Why would they turn? I think that's probably it. They took it for granted. You know, how, how often do we take and, and we take things for granted? They get complacent. Maybe not enough is being done for them. They get complacent. How do we fight that complacency? We get complacent in our jobs, don't we? Maybe we get complacent in our marriages. Maybe we get complacent in our parenting, in our friendships, in our work for the church. You know, there's a lot of different ways that we can kind of ease off the throttle a little bit and try to coast, isn't there? You know, how, how, how do we fight that? How do we stop that from happening? Yeah, we got a long, we got a lot of time. Y'all better start speaking up. I ain't even kidding. <laughs> How do we fight that? If you if you are able to or will take an inventory of yourself in line with God's word, and you've got to get into it mm -hmm. to know whether you're in line with it or not, then that'll help. Still, it's a problem for just about everybody. So, taking an inventory of yourself and matching it with the law of God, or looking at how your life compares with what God is telling you, that might be a very good motivator, isn't it? You know, how many of us actually think that we got this Christianity thing down? Got it nailed down. We won't admit it, but we act. <laughs> we, we won't admit it. But we certainly act like that sometimes, don't we? You know, Christianity is not just a word. You know, just like, just like being a faithful Jew at that time period wasn't just a word. It was an action. And as we allow those actions to kind of dissipate or we stop allowing ourselves to compare ourselves to what the law says or what the word says, and we start becoming more complacent, what happens? Other things become more alluring. We start allowing other things to creep in. You know, I want us to take a look at something. So uh, Manasseh, he reigned uh, for 25 years. And in 2 Chronicles, if you've got your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 13. 2 Chronicles thir uh, 33 and 13. Now, I want us to note something. Manasseh repented, and beginning in verse 13, he says, He prayed to him, and God was moved by his uh, entreaty, and heard his plea, and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. And Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Now we begin to read through the next couple of verses where Manasseh begins to build altars and tear down some things, and, and begins to try to move the people back to God. You know, Manasseh started off with paganistic uh, worship and worship of, of sacrificing of children. I mean, a lot of really bad stuff. But I want us to notice something down here at verse 17. After he's going through and he's, he's building altars to the Lord and he's, he's doing a couple of other good things for the Lord, in verse 17 it says, Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed at the high places but only to the Lord their God. Where were the people tell, told to sacrifice? Was that? The temple. What were these high places? Unauthorized places of 
unauthorized, man-made places of worship. Now, Manasseh started off with a good goal in mind, didn't he? Hey, I prayed to God, I repented, let's get our lives back on track, let's follow what God has to say. We're going to build altars to the Lord, we're going to, we're going to sacrifice properly, uh, we're going to tear down some of these high places maybe, but some of them we're going to leave up, and the people are going to worship there. So it sounds like to me, it sounds like he had good intentions, but he did not want to view the whole law as being the truth. He started becoming complacent again already, even in his decision to turn back to God. God, I'll come back to you and I will serve you the way that you want to be served, except for some convenience issues. Now, these people are still going to use these altars to worship you, God, so that's going to be cool, right? Well, was it cool? Not with God. Not with God. It's not. When God tells us to do something, when God gives us instruction for something to be done, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> do it. We're not supposed to turn to the right hand. We're not supposed to turn to the left hand. We're supposed to do it. But nonetheless, he certainly didn't, and he didn't view the law as being the whole law all the way through. So then Amon comes into power. And when we look at the parenting aspect here, kind of we're going to look at, at, at Manasseh's view of maybe following the law as not being something that has to be followed all the way. And what happens? What is Amon brought up into? He's brought up into a kingdom where following the law of the Lord exactly is not required. And so now Amon begins to rule however he wants to rule. And for two years, it's ruling of wickedness until his people finally have enough of it and kill him. And so, so comes Josiah. So Josiah is brought up into this whole thing, into this whole realm where maybe following God is not necessarily what has to be done. Evil is being run all through Judea. Uh, as we begin to see when, when Josiah begins to purge Judea, he has to make quite a trip in order to get rid of all this stuff. All of these idols, all of these altars to false gods, all of these pillars. He makes a big trip in order to get rid of all these things. So at 16, he begins to seek God. At 20, he begins to purge Judea and Jerusalem of those high places that we were just talking about. Uh, if we turn to chapter 33 and verse... Uh, well, we just read chapter 33 and verse 17. I'm sorry. All right, so at, at the age of 26... 26 for us is, is what kind of an age? How do we view a 26-year-old today? Still a baby? Still a baby? How do we view a 26-year-old today? An, an adult, young man? Um, for someone that's 26, what do we expect out of a 26-year-old? Maybe a sign of maturity starting to come into understanding, especially understanding what maturity means and some of the obligations and responsibilities of, of especially having the position that he has. You know, but it's still, 26 is kind of one of those coming to age time periods where uh, for us, maybe they're coming out of college and starting a new job. They've, uh, if they've decided not to go into a, a graduate level, level degree and they're wanting to go directly into the workforce after college. You know, we begin to see them kind of start making and, and understanding the world now outside of a student's eye and kind of more as a, as a, as a hard worker, as a, a, what we would kind of term an adult's eye, no longer being supported maybe by mom and dad. You know, so 26 is kind of one of those ages, again, where we still kind of ex expect some mistakes, but we expect for them to be making progress into, into being a productive member of society. You know, at 26 year old, at 26 in the military, that's about the age when most people will become what's called an, an NCO, a non-commissioned officer, able to lead in the military. You know, not everyone it takes that long, and some people actually take longer. I was with a uh, a guy who had put on what's called staff sergeant E5, who had been pushing 15 years as a uh, as an enlisted member, and hadn't made it past staff sergeant. And for those of y'all that don't understand what that means, is not showing the signs of maturity and not showing the signs of able to handle responsibility. Stuck in that 26-year-old state. You know, so we see that at this time, 
For him, Josiah decides that he is going to make some repairs to the temple. So at the age of 16, he does, he does what? He starts to follow after God. He starts to seek after God. Follow after the God of David. At 26, year old, at 26 years old, his 18th year of his reign, he begins to repair the temple. Now that's a fairly lofty endeavor, don't you think? What is the temple? Place of worship? What else is supposed to be at the temple? The ark. The Holy of Holies is supposed to be there. You know, this is the place where the high priest is supposed to go in yearly in order to pray to God. This is not just some closet in a building. This is a pretty big ordeal. You know, and as one begins to turn, like him, following after God and learning more about God and His ways, to me, going to the temple would be terrifying. Taking on an endeavor where this is the place that humans are supposed to have connection to God in the Old Testament. To me, it would be terrifying. But he decides that he's going to take that on. And in uh, chapter 34, and verse 11, uh, it describes that the kings of Judah, uh, Judah had let it go to ruin. So it's not something that is new. Uh, it wasn't as though it's, it's his lifetime that caused this thing to go into despair. It's been an ongoing problem. People not taking care of the things that God had told them to take care of. Uh, so if we are in chapter 34, we would look at verse 14, and as they are cleaning out the temple, making repairs to the temple, in verse 14, what do they find? The book of the law. Now, what is the book of the law? For us, it would be like this. For us, the, the, the God's word in entirety? At that time, what's the book of the law? The law as it was given to Moses. Okay, now, uh, there's been a couple of, uh, in, in doing my study of this, there's been a couple of, of scholars that say maybe it was the whole Torah, the first five books of the, uh, of the old law. Um, I kind of don't stand behind that, only because what we find out is that whenever he gets the book and he, and he brings it to Josiah, what does his servant do? In verse 16... Uh, Shapan brought the book to the king and further reported to the king all that was committed to your servant has been uh, uh, to your servant they are doing. They have emptied out the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have given it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. And in verse 18, and then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkeh, Hilkeah, uh, the priest, has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. Now, if it's the first five books of the, uh, of the Old Testament, he was reading for a while. So I don't necessarily think that that was exactly what they found. So what we look, what we kind of, kind of see is, it, we know that it is the law of God, right? We know that it is the law. Some, some people have come to believe that maybe it was a piece of text, Exodus 20, verse, uh, verse 19, through Exodus 23 and verse 33. Does anyone know what that is? I had to go and read it again, too. It's the, the law of covenant that God had given to Moses, and Moses brought down to the people, including the Ten Commandments. Now, this kind of fits a little bit more along the line of maybe what Josiah had gotten his hands on and began to read it. Um, because what happens whenever he reads the law or hears the law? For those of you all that know the story, what happens? What's that? He rent his clothes. So he tore his clothes. Why would he do such a thing? He was what? Grieving. grieving. Why would he be grieving? So you've been chasing after God, the God of David, 
following after him, trying to walk in those steps for almost 12 years, almost 14 years. And then you find the book of the law of the Lord and you find out you've been doing it wrong. Now here he is leading people. He's not just some regular guy. He is the leader of a nation. He's supposed to be taking care of these people, not only in the land and protection and, and money and crops and all these other things. What else is his responsibility? What's his responsibility as the king of Judah? His job as the leader was to also make sure that they were fed spiritually, that they were doing the will of the Lord. So yeah, when you say the word grieving as why he might have rent his clothes because he read the book of the law, I would 100% agree with that. It's probably a little bit of fear mixed with uh, a little bit of the, uh, the sadness that he hasn't been doing what he's doing. And the fear of not only that he's going to have to answer for what's been going on, but now he has got the undertaking of a lifetime that he has to, he has to, he has to start. He's going to have to rid the land of all of these things that are against what God has told him. That's quite a terrifying thing, isn't it? But he does it. You know, and how would you react if you found out that your entire Christian walk was wrong simply by reading the Bible, how would you react? I asked the lady that one time, and she said she would thank God. She would thank God, huh? You know, a lot of times we have to put ourselves in the shoes of those who are hearing the gospel maybe for the first time. And when I say hearing the gospel, I say, I mean hearing the true gospel, the whole gospel, the whole truth, not just simply what one person is telling them is true. You know, it helps us maybe to understand why people react the way that they do after hearing the gospel. Some people straight up deny it. You know, we have a, a lot of our family, or, or my family, is, is from Pennsylvania, and that's a, a really big uh, Catholic and, and Methodist area up there. You know, matter of fact, for where my family is at, the closest church is almost an hour away. You know, and, and a lot of times when we talk to them about the Bible and we'll show them verses and we'll show them what God has to say, in a lot of cases, there we were met with straight bewilderment. Like we are speaking Chinese to them. <laughs> like the, they'll look at the verse and they'll, they'll say, I've never read that before in my life. And we're like, what do you think it means? Well, it must not be important, is normally their answer. You know, sometimes we have to put ourselves in the other person's shoes, and maybe then we can connect with them on a level that will help them realize, just like what Josiah did, help them realize that this is a terrible situation to be in. Out of God's word, running on your own, and expecting to receive salvation. It's a terrible situation to be in. Yep. He, he accepted his responsibility to change, didn't he? You know, I wonder if Saul ever said, well, but that's not what my daddy did. You know, or that's not what my preacher told me. That's not what I was taught being brought up. You know, when we're faced with the cold, hard facts and the truth about what God is telling us to do, we have one responsibility. And that is simply to do it. And we're going to talk in, in just a little bit, we're going to talk about three points that we're going to gather from this whole thing. So I want y'all to hold on to this one topic right here, okay? Y'all go ahead and store that away. Using the little calculator, that memory button. Y'all go ahead and use that, because we're going to be talking about this. All right, so when, when uh, Josiah discovers the law, he makes a turn back to God. 
So he was already following God. In, in, in some essence, he was trying to follow after what David had told him, or after the, uh, not what David had told him, he didn't talk to David, but after what David was following, or who, who David was following. Uh, but now that he has the law, he wants to turn and do exactly what is right. Now, I find it interesting that when Josiah is given the law, what does he do? So he rents his clothes, he, he talks about how he wants to follow God, but then he gathers up a group of people, and what does he send them out to do? What would you do if you had the law and maybe you didn't fully understand it? What would you do if you were holding this law? You said, you know what? I want to do this thing right. What do I need to do next? Today we might whip out our, uh, our computers and start Googling. <laughs> Help me with this. You know, but they didn't have Google back then. They had go, seek, and find. So he told them, he told about a group of four people or so to go out and seek out people who knew the Lord. Seek out people who knew the Lord, so that way he could get some answers. Well, and he does. He gets some answers, and if we're looking in, in chapter 34, uh, they find a prophetess. And the prophetess tells him that he is definitely in trouble. The, 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 the nation is definitely in trouble because they haven't been following God. But because Josiah has humbled himself... God is going to spare his life in the essence that he is going to, he's going to die, but he has humbled himself before God, and in God's eyes, uh, he's accepting a repentance. But this kind of brings up a question for me, and something, again, that we're going to address in just a few minutes. Where were these folks? Where were these people? And I want you to think about that as we talk a little bit more of this. So Josiah makes a covenant with God in uh, verses 29 through 32. He makes a covenant to God, and he tells God that he is going to serve him with all his heart and all his soul. Now, who else said that we need to worship God in this manner? Jesus. Do you think that maybe this has a very profound meaning to God? What does it mean, first of all, to worship with all your heart and all your soul? What's that? To put him first. So when we think about heart, what do we think about? Think about the organ? Yeah, we're not talking about the ticker, are we? We're talking about something deeper. You know, I think about hearts. I think about Valentine's Day, right? And what is, what is the whole purpose of Valentine's Day? To spend money? No. What is the whole purpose of Valentine's Day? To express or to show someone that you love them, right? You know, so when we're told that we need to worship God with all of our heart, what are we supposed to be doing? Loving him. Loving him. Do you think that Josiah loved God? Why? What's that? He humbled himself. You know, he was chasing after God to begin with. He realized there was a relationship there that he needed to have. You know, David had a very special relationship with this, with this God, this Father. You know, Josiah recognized, even at 16 years old, that he needed to have that same relationship. And he spent his entire rest of his life trying to fix that relationship. You know, so in a lot of ways, we need to think about that as ourselves. We, when we look at what God says and we need to take and put our lives in line with God, we need to do it because we love God, just like Josiah did. And we need to spend the rest of our lives chasing after that relationship, following God's lead. Now, we already read what happens in, with Manasseh whenever we take and we don't do the whole thing. We set ourselves up for failure. We set our families up for failure. I believe that Manasseh set his son up. But when we spend our entire time chasing after what God has told us to do, chasing after that relationship and loving him with our whole heart, I believe that we're setting up not only ourselves for a good future, 
but we're setting up for our children a good future. Well, Josiah then holds a Passover. And it's the first Passover that's been held in a very long time. Matter of fact, this Passover goes down in record as being one of the greatest festivals to ever be held. He did it right. We need to make sure that we're doing the same thing. Now, uh, when we get to the end of uh, chapter 34, and we begin to look then at, or chapter 35 even, uh, we look at Josiah's end of his life. <clears throat> so Josiah lived or reigned for 31 years. That means that he died at the age of what? 38, 39, somewhere in there. Okay, Still somewhat of a young man, some people might say. Um, but definitely smart enough to make some pretty good, good choices. Uh, I kind of, uh, in my notes here, I had put, uh, after all that, he decided he wasn't going to listen. Typical kid. You know, so what happens with Josiah? What's he do? Well, Egypt, there's, a, there's the Pharaoh Necho, or Necho, and he is up fighting a battle, and, and Josiah decides that he's going to take his army up and go and meet him. Well, Necho sends him a message and says, God told me to fight this battle in a hurry, and why are you fighting against God? You need to get out of here. But what does Josiah do? Does anyone know? He acts foolishly. What's he do? Do you think he listens? <laughs> Probably not, right, since we're talking about the end of his life? No, he doesn't listen. He decides that he's going to dress himself as a soldier, and he goes into battle to fight anyhow. He doesn't listen. And he ends up taking an arrow, or being wounded by an archer is what it says. And then he dies. You know, so after all of that, after chasing after God, after, after listening to the counsel of those who knew about God and reforming his life and changing his ways and getting, getting Judah back on track, he ends up losing his life because he won't listen. Like I said, typical kid. Never listens, right? All right, so let's talk about three points that we can take home with this. You know, we, we've been talking about a young man starting at eight years old who, who built his way up, leading a nation of people. Um, following after God or chasing after God, trying to learn his ways. Of course, he had a lot of background. He could have gone in another direction, couldn't he have? He had a lot of setup to be going after some pagan gods, but he chose to follow God. You know, this kind of made me think as I was, as I was looking at this, and, and, you know, I have two little ones. Uh, Ava is, is almost five, and uh, she speaks her mind. You know, in a lot of cases, she tells me when I'm doing stuff wrong. You know, and, and in, a, in a lot of times when our children speak, do you think they're speaking from a biased standpoint? Or do you think they're speaking the honest truth? Well, the child almost always speaks the truth. <laughs> he doesn't know how to lie. The child almost doesn't know how to lie. They, they, when they speak, they speak some very profound things, don't they? You know, so it made me think, you know, sometimes we need to stop and listen to our youth. We need to stop and listen to them. I know this isn't going to be a popular thing for people to hear, but even if we just stopped and listened to what they have to say, the truths that come out of their mouth may be exactly what we, as the leaders, as the elders, as the overseers, as the parents, as the directors, as the teachers, Maybe it's exactly what we need to hear. Oftentimes we spend a lot of effort defending what we think is right when it's not biblically based. Now certainly if, if, if a child comes up and says, you know, I don't think we should do communion anymore. Well, let me, let me instruct you on the ways of God. You know, but in a lot of cases, I think that we have a lot of things that we can learn from our children. And when I mean children, I mean all the way up until 30, uh, 38 years old. Y'all can listen to us. It's cool. But we need to spend a lot of times, I think, you know, the saying has been said that God gave us two ears and one mouth. Why is that? Because we need to listen twice as much as we talk. I think there's a lot of, a lot of things that we can gain from listening. 
You know, sometimes we look down on our young people. Maybe we think that they're not smart enough. Maybe we think that they don't have enough life lessons behind their belt in order to start speaking their mind. You know, sometimes it's, it's those life lessons, it's those things that we have gone through that maybe have created a habit for us that is hard for us to get out of. Isn't it? You know, at the gym, I spend a lot of time reversing years of bad behavior. Even in myself. A lot of time trying to reverse years of bad behavior. Maybe it's time that we stopped thinking so much that we have the answers. Turn to God and maybe listen to what our kids have to say. See, we can, we can also teach our youth through communi communicating the mistakes we've made. Imagine if Manasseh had communicated with a uh, Amon. Imagine if he had actually talked to him. Don't follow after my ways, son. I did the wrong thing. I, pun I was punished for it, and I've turned back to God. Communication is a very big key. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, of course we know it says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. It's a good example for us. Sometimes the young people can be the examples that we need to be or that we need to follow. So the question then is, how can we encourage our young people to not only follow God, but be true leaders in faith? If an 8-year-old, 16-year-old, 26-year-old can take and make huge changes for an entire nation of people, how can we help our young people to follow after those kinds of steps? How can we lead them? How can we teach them? How can we guide them? I want to hear what you got. One of the best things is be the proper example. So right off the bat, being a good example. If you're not the proper example, nothing's going to happen. They're just going to follow, follow what we did, won't they? How else can we take and, and, and nurture our kids to be the leaders that they need to be in the church? Sign of encouragement? Okay. Let me ask you a question. So we're talking about the example thing. And now I know that we're, we're, we're kind of uh, quote-unquote preaching to the choir. It's Tuesday night, and here y'all are. What kind of example are we setting for our children when we're late to class to learn about God? On time. It's just not very important to be there. What kind of example are we showing them when we go on vacation and maybe we decide that we're going to skip a service or so. What are we teaching them? You know, I think Josiah is, is just a, a lucky, and when I say lucky, I just, I'm, what I mean is he is just a, a rare breed. Here's a, an eight-year-old that's raised until 16 that just decides that he's going to follow the God of David. Now, we may end up having lucky kids like that. We may not. So we have the opportunity to be able to teach them what's right, to help to lead them and show them how to do what's right. But you've got to make up in your mind that you're going to do it. You've got to make up in your mind that, you know what, excuses are no longer going to cut it. I'm going to lead my child into being what they need to be, the leader that they need to be in the church. I'm going to lead them to know that complacency in the church is not an option. Simply being a bystander, watching the church activities go on, waiting for the world to go around in circles, is not going to be enough. You need to be proactive. Eric, yes, sir. All we've got to do to recognize the absolute truth of what you're saying is to just look at church bulletins, the attendance records. Look at Sunday morning as opposed to Sunday evening as opposed to Wednesday night. Look at those who attend gospel meetings. 
look at those who don't come for Sunday morning Bible study and feel that they've done everything they need to do when they come to the 10 or 11 o'clock worship mm -hmm. and go home and you won't see them again until next Sunday at 10 or 11 o'clock. Yeah, I wonder what 16-year-old Josiah would say about that. You know, here he is following God without instructions. Can you imagine him sitting here being like, you guys have the instructions and you're not following it? What's wrong with you? He sought after God. And that brings me to my second point. So the first point is we need to listen to our youth. We need to encourage them and teach them and lead them to be the leaders that they need to be. Second point is when we look at when Josiah found the law and read it, he had to seek out godly people in order to understand it. You know, how often do we allow situations around us to get worse simply because we won't speak up? It had been 10 years since Manasseh. Why was nothing being done or said? Are we going to follow into that path? Are we going to wait for things to crumble around us? Are we going to wait for the church to, to, to start to really dwindle out before we decide that we're going to make a stand for what is true? and what is right. You know, working in the vineyard isn't a, a, a once a week thing, is it? How many of y'all are farmers? Grow anything? I don't, I don't grow things, I kill them, apparently. <laughs> How many of y'all grow things? I grow things. You grow some stuff? I was raised as a farmer's son. Well, how often do you have to spend out there in the field? You thought it never ended. You fall asleep out there doing work, right? I don't know about falling asleep. <laughs> Meaning you spend a lot of time out there. You know, when are we going to get into this idea in our, or get this idea out of our minds that someone else is going to do the work? When are we going to get that out of our minds? You know, someone else is going to take care of it. You know what? We need teachers. You know what? Someone else will do it. You know, we need people to step up. We're going to do some door knocking. You know what? Someone else is going to do it. You know, whatever the, the, the mode of, of trying to get God's word out there, you know, in most of our minds, it's called the bystander effect. It's an actual thing. When are we going to get outside of that? When are we going to say that it's no one else's responsibility but mine? Josiah had to seek out godly people. Give me a break. Really? Are people having to seek us out? Or are we going out there and proclaiming the gospel like we were told to do in Matthew chapter 28? We can't have it both ways. It's got to be one or the other. What's your answer going to be? Work or no work? Sit back and wait? How many of y'all are fishermen? We'll put it into another, uh, another analogy. Yeah. How many of y'all fish where there's no fish? And just kind of hope a fish swims your way and maybe grabs your bait? You don't. Unless you're just one of those fishermen who just want to be out of the house. You know, A bad day fishing beats a good day working. And it ain't true in the church. It isn't true that way. So as godly people, we must be out making sure that they don't have to seek us out. We seek them out. My last point is this. Is to keep the whole law. In 2 Chronicles 34 and verse 31 and the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. How many of us seek after keeping all the law. You know, no, we're going we're gonna to go right back into the attendance thing again. How many of us seek after keeping all the law? Now let's talk about another subject that's not, that's not a popular one. Let's talk about giving. How many of us seek after keeping all the law? 
You know, let's, let's talk about purity real quick. How many of us seek after keeping all the law? Lying? How many of us seek after keeping all the law? Brotherly kindness. How many of us seek after keeping all the law? How do we fix it? Because I know what's going through your head. I hear you, Aaron. I hear you. I, I know what the Bible says. I know what it's saying. How do I fix this? How do we fix this problem? How do we fix the complacent church? How do we fix the, the hiding from situations? How do we fix the not listening to God? How do we fix this, church? How do we fix this? What's that? Repent. Repent. Okay. Just treating symptoms. I like that. Until you decide that God is truly God and what God has to say truly matters and you repent and you love Him with all your heart and all your soul and as Jesus said, all your mind, you can't fix it. It takes a full-on effort. It takes a life change, which is why Paul talks about us being new creatures. We're not the same things we were before. He's not saying we're new people. He said we're new creatures. We're not the same. We're changed. We're different. We're better. And that's the problem with us as adults. See, are we teaching our kids that the whole law doesn't matter? Like Manasseh taught his son. Are we going to step up and be like Josiah? What are we going to do, church? Well, I think, I, I think I'm about three minutes short. Am I good? Thank you all so much for the class. Thank you very much for, uh, for helping me get through it and, uh, and, and speaking up. I really appreciate that. Love you all so much. Thank you.